We may not have a perfect model, but we have embraced the rigours of corporate governance with initiatives such as AXI. As we increasingly invest offshore, our governance standards will be challenged in other markets. But before we get ahead of ourselves, there's still plenty of work to be done at home. The four biggest issues that we're dealing with at the moment are the review of the ASX corporate governance guidelines, the role of independent non-executive directors, and the management of conflicts of interest where there's takeover talks. Um, thirdly, there's executive remuneration. The, the debate there has not gone away. And the other thing that we're looking at, the fourth sort of aspect, is the broadening of corporate governance to take into consideration environmental and social issues. Organisations like AXI have moved at about the right pace. I don't, you know, they, 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 there, there is not a need to uh, be um, uh, radical, uh, and indeed that would be counterproductive, but they need to be progressive, they need to show leadership, and they have. There's a role for the Australian superannuation industry to try and encourage the development of better governance practices in the emerging, emerging markets, and particularly in, in Asia, where you know, we do have an existing uh, relationships and, and some influence, I think, to be able to uh, encourage governments and also institutions in those markets to um, improve their corporate governance practices. It's lovely to be back in Australia. It's wonderful to see how the, uh, the work on superannuation has grown and, uh, and also I think the international respect for what Australia is doing is, is going ahead by leaps and bounds. So my pleasant task today really is just not to talk to you about Australia, you're the people who know best what's going on here, but um, to give you a, a glimpse of some of the issues and debates that are going on in other markets. We are all invested in each other's markets increasingly. The extent to which your investments are protected, the extent to which you as a shareholder um, can take initiatives to protect that money, um, make sure it's being properly managed, um, are going to have an impact on the returns. And uh, therefore, I guess corporate governance is really just a very simple kind of um, do-it-yourself kit for looking after money wherever it might be. But first, let me just say something very briefly about ICGN. Basically, an organization which links together groups of investors in different countries. Uh, now, it was set up in 1995. Um, by a group that decided that because they were starting to invest overseas, it'd be a good idea to find out what the locals thought um, about what was going on and try and understand better what was happening in different markets. And that's become um, more important as those overseas portfolios have got bigger. So this globalization really means that um, uh, people worried about what's happening with superannuation and other forms of investment really need to join hands, understand what's going on, and also support each other when there's the opportunity to um, to make reform. The other thing I should mention about ICGN is it's a not-for-profit network and it's governed by the members. So what we do, um, this is just, I would just suggest I don't run through this, but you take a look at the website to see the different activities. Um, apart from being a network for the exchange of ideas and information, which is very important, and give them a chance to get to know each other and uh, build up those relationships of trust and understanding on the basis of which they can then do things. The other bit of our work um, is also pretty practical. What we do is um, lobby on behalf of um, investors for the sorts of reforms that are going to protect um, long-term shareholders in these different markets. So what's powerful here is that if you've got investors in 40-odd countries representing whatever it is now, $10 trillion US, I think our members between them are responsible for, that really is a group worth listening to. Our aim really is to build up a consensus about what's reasonable internationally, but also to put it forward from the position of a long-term owner. Um, and that's, I think, important in terms of all the reforms that are going on at the moment. The other thing that we do is um, sort of develop practical toolkits that investors can use. So if you look on the website, you'll see that some of the, the world's most mind-numbingly dull subjects um, hopefully are explained. Um, and you've got model documents there which you can take back um, as trustees to your fund to help you develop a policy on an issue uh, which might need dealing with. For example, one of the most recent things we've been looking at is stock lending. Well, this is 
the misnomer of all time, but you'll understand that um, as part of keeping um, books balanced in the market, um, stock can be lent out. Now, of course, when the the, the stock goes, the votes go with it. And what we've seen in um, all sorts of places is that um, people wanting to influence the outcome of a vote at a meeting can borrow stock for X amount of money um, without actually having to purchase the underlying amount. And it's proven to be quite controversial. So we've got a model um, statement which can be included into your stock lending contracts, which mean basically that you as the ultimate owner get the chance to call your votes back if there's some hot issue coming up and you need to make sure that your your views um, are being expressed at the AGM, not the sort of Johnny-come-lately who's just borrowed your shares in order to get hold of the votes for a short period. So what I want to do is just um, give you some of the headlines. Your funds, I'm sure, own shares in American companies, but actually knowing what's happening in America is going to be of huge importance, not just because it's the world's largest capital market, but there tends to be a big knock-on effect from what the United States decides to do or not to do. Um, and at the moment, there are a lot of reforms, a lot of controversies, a lot of issues. Patrick's going to talk about some more of them in a minute. Um, but I just want to flag up a few things that are going on. Um, and again, I think there's this great opportunity to link up with the long-term shareholders in the US and actually start making positive and practical reforms. The sort of quick three-step in the United States that we've seen is one, scandals. Um, Enron, Global Crossing, WorldCom, uh, Adelphi, um, Health South, you name it. The, the US had a spectacular collection of collapses. Um, that followed in short order by a huge new wave of uh, legislation named for the two, um, uh, the, the Democrat and the Republican which sponsored this jointly, Sarbanes-Oxley. Sarbanes-Oxley has just changed the name of the game in the US uh, quite dramatically. But that has, as the markets have recovered, as you'd expect, we've swiftly seen that followed by some quite serious corporate pushback. And there is real hand-wringing going on at the moment about whether the United States has overdone it. Um, I guess our view is that an opportunity was missed after the, all those corporate collapses. If you're running um, a situation where the board directors cannot be removed, where the shareholders cannot file a binding resolution, you can't call a meeting of the company, um, and you can't vote no on the appointment of a director. Your options really are sell or sue. Really, shareholders in the USA are powerless. Um, and when your money's over there, you need to know that, um, that those are the sort of governance risks that you're running. But rather than, as I said, being passive about it, there's a great opportunity at the moment to be really pushing hard. And there are quite a, um, an important group of um, US superannuation funds uh, and others um, uh, the Taft Hartleys, uh, the public funds, some of the union sponsored funds working together with overseas investors um, to start persuading companies to allow shareholders to vote no as well as yes. So we all need to be working hard backing up those calling for reform. We're having a mid-year meeting in New York uh, on October the 29th. Um, the idea being that we want to bring the international investment community to New York and actually map out the Bill of Rights, if you like. What is it really that long-term owners want and expect from the US market? Um, and I hope that's going to be an opportunity to pull some of these strands together. Europe is also in the midst of a huge battle on reform. You, you think about the collection of the old Europe, the um, uh, continental European countries, and think about the difference in their law, their language, uh, their culture, their approach, and imagine trying to piece that all together into an integrated capital market. That's one heck of a reform project. And the European Commission, which has responsibility for drawing up plans, uh, regularly puts things forward to the European Parliament, which has to look at issues like takeovers and auditing and accounting and shareholder rights. And um, it's a very, very sensitive and contested, sort of very political. It's, it's as political as it is in the United States. Now, what I would say about the um, situation in Europe at the moment is you've got the UK, which by far and away the biggest um, markets by value, and the UK sort of model is much admired. However, there's a big hole in the London market. And again, for those of you invested in 
uh, UK shares something to be thinking about, is that the lovely Cadbury Committee Code, uh, now the Combined Code, which sets out all the great and wonderful things that companies could and should be doing within this framework of pretty strong shareholder rights, comply or explain. Well, that's fair and reasonable. However, the UK, which is now about a quarter to a probably more, uh, but a good chunk of that market is foreign listings, um, are not covered by the code. Um, you don't have to abide by the combined code. You um, tell us how you uh, abide by your local code. Now, if the local code in the local market is as good as the combined code, then fine. Although, when you look at the, uh, some of the major companies listing from Kazakhstan and Russia, I can tell you, even if the code on paper might look pretty good, um, the enforcement and practices that stand behind it are pretty close to criminal uh, in some cases. So, you know, the question here is, have we, has London started to attract, in a rather reckless way, companies which are running big risks and where um, shareholders aren't protected and are we riding for a fall? So a big issue for us at the moment is engaging with the UK authorities about this to actually get um, some basic um, uh, compliance in the system for the foreign listings. On the European directives, um, there is a shareholder rights directive, as I mentioned, going through. Um, that seems to be making reasonable progress, and it will do things like um, allow investors to get information in advance of meetings. It will allow shareholders to vote by proxy. Although it's doing lots of good and sensible things, um, Europe hasn't tackled some of the most controversial issues. And the big issue is one share, one vote. Now, even if you've got the information in time and you can vote by proxy and uh, all of this good stuff, of course, this isn't much good to you if your vote um, on your share counts for one and uh, the controlling shareholder has votes which count for 10 or 100. So, you know, you're getting to a point where minority shareholder rights in Europe are not well protected in some markets and there's still a lot to do. The emerging markets... Um, I think some of the emerging markets are so big, uh, they are the economic future, they can't be ignored, um, even if we want to ignore them, we can't ignore them. Um, and the question therefore is what do you do? Do you avoid, do you just keep well away, stay at home, where things are comfortable, known and understood, or do, uh, do super funds here and the big investment institutions internationally actually begin to reach out to these markets and start a dialogue? And sometimes uh, that dialogue will be in very tough and very controlled conditions. You can imagine that a discussion about transparency and accountability um, of state-owned enterprises is going to be one of those um, uh, interesting moments of irony if you're sitting with all the state-owned uh, enterprises. But the point is those discussions have to be held. And China at the moment is very well aware that regardless of the rate of growth, keeping pace with the population and its needs, um, they've still got to keep that pressure on. And their need for resources, their need for investment, but not only investment, it's technical know-how on how to develop their own capital markets. They have a huge internal savings rate of 40%. I mean, we all wish we had something like that in our own markets. But how that money gets deployed effectively is still a big question for China. And they've come to realize that corporate governance, how these enterprises are owned and controlled, is going to have a huge impact economically. And also, they're trying to work out how they're going to develop a funded pension system. And if they're going to do that, where's that money going to be invested? In other words, Chinese companies have to become safe for Chinese savers, and at the moment, um, it feels more like a casino uh, than a well-developed capital market. I would also say um, countries like India have a very different um, situation, not least because the private sector has been established um, for you know over 100 years, the stock markets are over 100 years old. China's sort of democratic chaos gives different problems and opportunities, but India is growing very rapidly, and again, what India realizes is it's got to smarten up its act on enforcement uh, and implementation um, if it's going to attract money. Um, interesting work that, that's been done in other markets like Brazil and South Africa, which show that if you do build a, a clean bit of the market on governance standards, you can actually attract money. So I think there's some you know, bright, bright points on the horizon. Everybody's ed editorials, what are we all worrying about? Uh, private equity. The big concern that um, public markets might be under threat, jobs 
um, are going, as companies are asset stripped, fees are going through the ceiling. And on the other side, there's a worry that, well, maybe because we've failed uh, to keep a grip on companies and uh, boost the performance that they're capable of, the private equity boys and girls can come in, put themselves on the board, have direct control, and they're the ones who can actually turn the companies around. And I think private equity, therefore, does pose a big challenge. However, the bulk of that private equity money is still your members' money. Most of that private equity money is coming from the collective savings vehicles. So getting a policy in that area uh, and keeping track of what's going on is really very important. I would say exactly the same thing for hedge funds, uh, famously called locusts in Germany uh, by the Christian Democrats. And there is a very serious debate with Angela Merkel, uh, the chancellor in Germany, sparking with the G7 at the moment, to say, you know, hedge funds are in danger of wrecking, uh, wrecking economies and we need to do something about them. Um, again, if, if they are behaving in that way, they're doing it with your members' money and having a policy on these issues is absolutely critical. Linked to all of that is a great debate about the short term and the long term. Obviously, the liabilities of your members run, uh, you know, the best part of 50 years. Uh, and, of course, this should be a match made in heaven for companies who have investors with that sort of time horizon. Everything is possible. Of course, by the time the money is delegated and intermediated and performance targets are set, uh, which measure by quarters of a year, not by quarters of a century, then uh, companies and others can feel under a lot of pressure. There is some real evidence, certainly in the US, that these short-term pressures are felt and they're affecting behavior. And not least in all of that is remuneration. If you set packages for executives um, with uh, short-term targets with no downside, i.e. share options, uh, don't be surprised if um, companies are run in the way um, that hits those targets. At this stage, it's important to realize even 10 years ago, we were arguing about completely different issues. We weren't arguing about private equity and hedge funds. We were arguing about, do companies serve shareholders or stakeholders? As though these two things were in conflict. Uh, and I think it's now, that's over. We all understand that value comes out of the deployment of human and financial capital and that corporate responsibility affects not just business reputation, but it is part of companies being uh, an integral uh, part of society. Also, we were arguing about the role of boards. What do boards do? Are they there to supervise, to check, to box tick, or are they there to try and encourage performance? And again, that debate is over. Yes, compliance matters, but the role of the board in strategy is well understood, uh, and that's really the focus. What's on the to-do list? The first thing, and it's very basic, but the shareholder rights agenda. As we go global with portfolios, we really need to get that bit of the governance system fixed. Because if you can't protect yourself as a shareholder, and you can't rely on the law, and you can't rely on the regulator to do it for you, uh, really then you're running risks that you don't need to. What goes with rights, of course, is responsibilities. We've got quite a big project on this, but we really want to get the, if you like, the Bill of Rights for shareholders shackled to an equally important Bill of Responsibilities. The third part of the, the big job still to be done is building on the international cooperation. For Australia, um, what you've done, not just in terms of building your superannuation industry, but also in terms of your approach to corporate governance, there's a lot to be learned from and a lot to be um, uh, admired about the Australian system. And I think there's a great opportunity for, for more countries to understand how you've put the whole thing together. And on the shareholder responsibilities front, it's no good you know, talking about responsible ownership if governance of uh, uh, the investors is a complete mess. And in many markets, that's where it is. You know, trustees aren't independent. There are not defined standards of training. You don't have the right to independent advice. There are no rules on conflicts of interest. And surprise, surprise, you find that votes go missing and decisions are made that don't seem to be in the beneficiary's interest. Throughout Europe, throughout the emerging markets, funded retirement systems are coming into place. Um, and that's good. I mean, savings for retirement, that's all good. But that then poses the question, where will be the safe haven for investment? And that's why corporate governance is so important.